All right, everybody. Uh, welcome back to uh, the next episode of Hawk Droppings. It's a special midnight edition. Uh, it is February 13th, 2024. It's about 11.50 p.m., give or take. I'm recording this a day late and very late in the day uh, because I'm still in a jury trial right now. We started our fifth week of trial today. Uh, hopefully next week will be our last week of trial and I'll be able to get back on a, a bit more normal of a schedule. Uh, so I apologize for being a day late with this episode. Um, what are we going to talk about today? So last week, uh, on February 6th, the DC circuit court of appeals issued their ruling, their opinion, uh, on Donald Trump's appeal regarding his presidential immunity claims, immunity from prosecution after he left office for allegedly criminal acts he took or committed while he was in office. Uh, and that results from an order that was issued by a DC district court judge, trial court judge, Tanya Chutkin, uh, on December 1st <clears throat> of last year. So procedure, So we're going to talk about three documents today. Uh, we're going to talk about that first order, the December 1st order from Judge Tanya Chutkin. We're going to talk about the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals decision. Uh, and then uh, yesterday, Monday, February 12th, Donald Trump appealed that decision uh, appellate decision to the United States Supreme Court. Uh, and we're going to talk about his writ for certiorari. I have never, ever figured out how to accurately pronounce that word. So we just call it a writ of cert. Uh, that's kind of our legal shorthand for those things, a writ of cert. So these are the three documents we're going to talk about today. The first, so procedurally, how did, how did these documents come into existence? Well, it, Donald Trump was indicted by Jack Smith on four felony counts in Washington, D.C. Uh, for his efforts to overturn the 2020 election uh, and to take advantage of the violence at the Capitol on January 6th in an effort to remain in power. Uh, even though he had lost the 2020 election and he knew that he had lost the 2020 election. And within the context of that criminal case at the trial level, uh, which had been set for trial on March 5th, that, that date has been vacated. Um, we'll come back and talk about that uh, in, in a few minutes. Uh, within the context of that criminal case, he filed a motion to dismiss, and it was based, was based on a couple things. Uh, that was the first time that he had raised his claims of presidential immunity from criminal prosecution uh, after leaving office. And he made a bunch of arguments on First Amendment grounds, and then he also made a double jeopardy argument. Double jeopardy essentially means you can't be tried for the same crime twice, and his argument on double jeopardy, which we'll talk about, centers on the impeachment clause of the Constitution. He's basically arguing that because he was impeached by the House, but was not convicted by the Senate, he was not convicted and removed from office um, because Republicans are too afraid of his base. Uh, he's like, I've already been tried for this in the Senate. Well, that's not a criminal court. So that's a dumb argument. But we'll talk about we'll talk more about that in a minute. So he filed his motion, uh, Jack Smith filed an opposition, uh, Judge Tanya Chutkin held a hearing on it. And uh, she issued a 48 page decision. Uh, which I think is just I, you know, but I'm a nerd for this kind of stuff. I think this is just a completely uh, beautiful piece of legal writing. It's written very clearly. It's written very easy, easy to understand. Uh, 
it's structured in a way that makes sense. It's very methodical. She goes through all of his arguments in great detail and dismantles every single one of them. And so we're going to spend a little time going through this opinion. It's 48 pages long, came out on December 1st. Uh, you can Google it. It's very easy to find. I highly recommend that people read it. Uh, but I'm going to read some quotes from it, and um, and we'll discuss some stuff. So at the motion to dismiss stage, this court assumes the truth of the indictment's allegations. So in federal court, when a defendant, a criminal defendant, files a motion to dismiss the case, uh, the trial judge is like, okay, I'm going to read your motion to dismiss, but I'm going to read it within the context of I'm going to assume that all of the allegations in the indictment are true. And it's because the burden at a, on a motion to dismiss is on the defendant. Uh, and, and so the court is like, fine, you can file that motion, but I'm going to assume that everything in the indictment is true. It puts a pretty high burden uh, on the defendant, but it just takes that analysis right out of, of, of uh, the process because there hasn't been a trial yet. There hasn't been an adjudication on any of the allegations in the indictment. So the trial court assumes that those are true. Uh, and so Trump starts off by, quote unquote, you know, describing, excuse me, the charges uh, against him in the indictment. He describes them in a way that is pathetic and is a joke. Uh, and the judge concludes, those generalized descriptions fail to properly portray the conduct with which Trump has been charged. Accordingly, <laughs> this is why I love Judge Chuckin, man. This, uh, she's, she is such a great federal judge. Accordingly, this court will briefly review the central allegations as set forth in the indictment. And... So then she just goes through the history. You know, he was the 45th president. He lost the election. These are the things he did to try to overturn the election. And, and she addresses the six unindicted co-conspirators in this order as well. Uh, defendant, along with at least six co-conspirators, undertook efforts to impair, obstruct, or defeat uh, through dishonesty, fraud, and deceit the results of the 2020 election. Those efforts took five alleged forms. First, Trump and his co-conspirators used knowingly false claims of election fraud to get state legislators and election officials to subvert the legitimate election results and change the electoral votes for the defendant's opponent, Joe Biden, to electoral votes for the defendant. That's an exceedingly rich allegation. Uh, I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, Trump twists that around when he made his argument to the appellate court and makes an argument. We'll, we'll get to it in a bit. He makes an argument that you're just sitting there like going, wow, that's a lot, even for this guy. Um, second, they organized fraudulent slates of electors in seven targeted states, Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, New Mexico, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, attempting to mimic the procedures that the legitimate electors were supposed to follow under the Constitution and other federal laws. Third, they attempted to use the power and authority of the Justice Department to conduct sham election crime investigations and to send letters to those targeted states that falsely claimed that the Justice Department had identified significant concerns that may have impacted the election outcome. Those letters sought to advance the defendant's fraudulent elector plan by using the Justice Department's authority to falsely present the fraudulent electors as a valid alternative to the legitimate electors, and that urged on behalf of the Justice Department the targeted state legislators to convene to create the opportunity to choose the fraudulent electors over the legitimate electors. Fourth, using knowingly false claims of election fraud, 
They attempted to convince the vice president to use the defendant's fraudulent electors, reject legitimate electoral votes, or send legitimate electoral votes to state legislatures for their review rather than counting them. Mike Pence did not have the power to do those things. Fifth, on the afternoon of January 6, once a large and angry crowd, and it was actually an angry crowd of large people, <laughs> sorry, including many individuals whom the defendant had deceived into believing the vice president could and might change the election results, violently attacked the Capitol and halted the proceeding. They exploited the disruption by redoubling efforts to levy false claims of election fraud and convince members of Congress to further delay the certification based on those false claims. Based on this conduct, the indictment charges defendant with four counts, conspiracy to defraud the United States, conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding, obstruction of and attempt to obstruct an official proceeding, and conspiracy against rights. Executive immunity. Defendant contends that the Constitution grants him absolute immunity from criminal prosecution for actions performed within the, quote, outer perimeter of his official responsibility while he served as President of the United States so long as he was not both impeached and convicted for those actions. So that's his reliance on the impeachment clause. And he takes a section of the impeachment clause and changes its meaning to say, I can only be criminally convicted after I leave office if I was impeached by the House and convicted and removed from office by the Senate. He's wrong on that. The Constitution's text, structure, and history do not support his contention. No court or any other branch of government has ever accepted this claim of immunity, and this court will not so hold. Former presidents enjoy no special conditions on their, crim on their federal criminal liability. Defendant may be subject to federal investigation, indictment, prosecution, conviction, and punishment for any criminal acts while undertaken while in office. And so here she begins her methodical process in going through Trump's claims. He says, the Constitution bestows this immunity on me. She's like, all right, let's look to the Constitution. There is no provision in the Constitution conferring the immunity that defendant claims. The Supreme Court has already noted the absence of explicit constitutional guidance on whether a president possesses any immunity. That's from Nixon v. Fitzgerald. The executive branch has likewise recognized that the Constitution provides no explicit immunity from criminal sanctions for any civil officer, including the current president. Current president. The DOJ has a couple of memos out there that say you can't prosecute a current sitting president for criminal offenses. Those have not really been tested in court. Uh because nobody's ever indicted a sitting president while he was in office, or she. And so those memos have never been tested by the courts. They've never been tested by a federal court, an appellate court, uh, or the United States Supreme Court. There is no presidential immunity clause. This lack of constitutional text is no accident. So here she discussed, so here are some areas where the framers and the authors of the Constitution did write some specific immunity clauses and included them specifically in the Constitution. They specifically did not include any type of presidential immunity language in the Constitution. She talks about the speech and debate clause uh, that confers immunity on members of the House and the Senate. They can't be criminally prosecuted for things they say uh, while they are debating legislation. Um, and, you know, she goes back to the history of the creation of the Constitution and Federalist Papers 
Uh, nor is the Constitution silent on this question because its drafters and ratifiers assumed the president would enjoy the immunity that the defendant claims. To the contrary, America's founding generation envisioned a chief executive wholly different from the unaccountable, almost omnipotent rulers of other nations at the time, monarchs, kings. In Federalist Number 69, titled the don't laugh at that, titled The Real Character of the Executive, Alexander Hamilton emphasized the the total dissimilarities between the president and the king of Britain, Uh, the latter being sacred and inviolable in that there is no constitutional tribunal to which he is amenable, no punishment to which he can be subjected, the king. That widely acknowledged contrast between a sitting president and a king is even more compelling for a former president. There is no immunity uh, for former presidents, and the Constitution does not reflect an understanding that any such immunity has ever existed. So then Trump switches over in his arguments to the impeachment judgment clause and, again, making his argument that a former president can only be prosecuted if he had been impeached by the House and removed by the Senate. And she, uh, Judge Chutkin, uh, right here, defendant's interpretation of this clause collapses under the application of common sense. (laughs) So common sense is a Latin term. in the law. <laughs> I'm kidding. She basically just told his attorneys that he's that they're morons. Um, for one, his reasoning is based on the logical fallacy of denying the antecedent. From the statement, if an animal is a cat, it can be a pet. It does not follow that if an animal is not a cat, it cannot be a pet. <laughs> Yet defendant argues that because a president who is impeached and convicted may be subject to criminal prosecution, a president who is not impeached and convicted may not be subject to criminal prosecution. It's a dumb argument. There's no support for it. Um, And she goes into a little history. Vice President Aaron Burr was indicted without being impeached. And the same, you know, if you haven't listened to um, Rachel Maddow put out, it's like a six or eight part, uh, podcast a couple of years ago called Bagman. I highly, highly recommend it. Uh, cause she talks, Judge Chutkin talks in her decision about former vice president Spiro Agnew under Richard Nixon, Nixon who resigned from office because he was being threatened with criminal prosecution. He resigned basically as part of a plea deal because he was taking cash bribes from people while he was serving as vice president of the United States. It's just, it's an, it's an, it's an astonishing, it's an astonishing story that I had never heard anything about. I mean, the dude was taking satchels of cash in his office while he was serving as vice president. It was the most brazen criminality apart from Donald Trump. It, it, it's an amazing, it's an amazing story, but he was going to get criminally prosecuted while sitting in office as vice president of the United States of America. And he pled no low contender to criminal charges. Uh, and part of his plea deal was that he resign at the office of the vice presidency That's how we ended up with Gerald Ford. And then Nixon got bounced. And that's how Gerald Ford became president. It's a crazy freaking story, man. Bagman by Rachel Maddow. Highly recommend it. It's really worth it's really worth the time to listen to. Um, Finally, defendants interpretation of the impeachment judgment clause would produce implausibly perverse results. (laughs) The Constitution permits impeachment and conviction for a limited category of offenses, treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. And the phrase high crimes and misdemeanors is not defined. 
Helpful. Thanks, guys. Uh, under the defendant's reading, if a president commits a crime that does not fall within those categories and so could be impeached and convicted, the president could never be prosecuted for that crime. Alternatively, if Congress does not have the opportunity to impeach or convict a sitting president, perhaps because the crime occurred near the end of their term or is covered up until the, after the president has left office, the former president similarly could not be prosecuted. Defendant seems to suggest that this scenario in which the former president would be utterly accountable for their crimes is simply the price we pay for separation of powers. Nothing in the Constitution's text supplies the immunity that defendant claims or supports any of his arguments. Uh, let's see. Do I want to read this part? So then, okay, so then Trump goes on to argue that basically, well, presidents have civil immunity. They have immunity from civil claims while they're in office. So then they should have immunity from criminal claims as well. And it's like, eh, not really. Um, and, and he says, you know, he's making kind of a structural argument, kind of. Um, the, the prospect of federal criminal liability, again, for a former president does not violate the structural principle either by imposing unacceptable risks of vexatious litigation or by otherwise chilling the executive's decision-making process. Indeed, it is likely that a president who knows that their actions may one day be held to criminal account will be motivated to take greater care that the laws are faithfully executed. If you know you can be prosecuted when you leave office for criminal acts, you're going to go out of your way while you're in office to not commit criminal acts. It's not a tricky concept. Ugh. And Trump goes on to, he just makes some crazy ass arguments. He says that, um, you know, because the, you know, and, and he says this properly. I mean, it's, a, you know, it goes back to Marbury v. Madison. The office of the presidency is a unique office within the United States of America and within the structure of the United States government. It was set up that way on purpose. Uh, it's the only office of its kind, but the duty, the main duty of the president of the United States is to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. That's the, that it be executed executive branch. The, the job of the president is to execute the laws <laughs> in a faithful manner and not, you know, violate them every day, not commit nine felonies before lunch. Um, you know, that that duty does not grant special latitude to the president to violate those laws. That is especially true when the violations require criminal intent. The rationale for immunizing a president's controversial decisions from civil liability does not extend to sheltering his criminality. So she's saying civil immunity from civil lawsuits does not extend to criminal charges. And one of my favorite arguments, let me see if we get to this first. And, you know, again, it's like if you're going to be prosecuted, then you're going to go out of your way not to break the law while you're in office. Second, um, I will skip that part. This, I love this. Defendant also warns that if he is not given immunity here, criminal prosecutions will bedevil every future presidential administration and usher in a new era of political recrimination and division. That is exactly what he is saying he is going to do if he is reelected. He says he's going to put the whole Biden crime family in prison. He's going to put Obama in prison. I think he wants to put George W. Bush in prison. He is saying he will do exactly that when he's giving campaign speeches. Here's the best part. As defendant acknowledges, he is the only former president in United States history to face criminal charges for acts committed while in office. He's the only one. 
250 years of history. He's like, unless you give me immunity, then every single president is going to be subject to criminal prosecution. The court's like, ah, oh, that's weird. You're the first person that's ever, this has ever happened to in 250 years. <laughs> Despite defendant's doomsaying, he points to no evidence that his criminal liability in this case will open the floodgates to a waiting flood of federal prosecutions. And then she goes on to say, you know, prosecutors are restrained by their ethical obligations uh, and federal indictments are brought by federal grand juries and they have ethical obligations and procedures they have to follow as well. There are safeguards in place to prevent exactly what Trump is talking about, short of creating this immunity that he claims he has. Um, so public interest. Um, on the other side of the scale, the public interest in the prosecution of this case carries grave weight. The Supreme Court has repeatedly underscored its judgment that the public interest in fair and accurate judicial proceedings as at its height in criminal settings. It has correspondingly refused to permit other concerns, including those asserted by presidents, to prevail over the fundamental demands of due process of law in the fair administration of criminal justice. That's also Nixon v. Fitzgerald. Um, and she goes into some really interesting history in her analysis as well. Um, it is no surprise that the Supreme Court has long recognized a special public interest in criminal law because of its distinctly communal character. That character is reflected both in the Constitution itself and the legal tradition from which it arose. Unlike defendants in a civil matter, for example, federal criminal defendants are constitutionally guaranteed a speedy and public trial before a jury drawn from their community. And then I'll read this next little section here. It gives some context for the history of why we have juries of our peers, juries drawn from the community. And it's something I hadn't thought about in 25 years. Uh, the preeminent 18th century legal commentator, William Blackstone, explained the reason for the community's special interest in criminal cases. Whereas civil juries are an infringement or privation of the civil rights which belong to individuals, considered merely as individuals, crimes are a breach and violation of the public rights and duties due to the whole community, considered as a community. So crimes hurt the entire community. And so members of that community are then invited to sit on juries in criminal trials where those individuals who broke the law and committed crimes, criming crimers, the criming crimers, uh, when they're brought to justice, uh, jury of your peers. So there you go. All right. Learn a little history here. All right. A little bonus plan. Um, and so then she talks about, so let's look at the specific things that he's charged with. And, what Congress chose to do with those kinds of offenses because he's charged with violating federal criminal statutes. Well, federal criminal statutes are written by Congress. They're passed by Congress, by the House and the Senate, and they're signed into law by the president. Congress could have chosen to impose civil penalties for those four crimes that Donald Trump is charged with. But instead, when writing these criminal code sections, they decided to impose criminal liability for someone who commits these acts. So it's a separation of powers issue as well, because the Congress, using its legislative authority and processes under Article I uh, of the Constitution, chose to make these actions criminal offenses as opposed to civil offenses, for which, you know, you would just pay a fine. Um, more, most importantly, a former president's exposure to federal criminal liability is essential to fulfilling our constitutional promise of equal justice under the law. The government of the United States has been emphatically termed a government of laws and not of men, again with the Marbury v. Madison. 
uh, goes through some more precedent. So here's a part that I loved. Um, again, some more interesting history. Uh, she quotes George Washington's uh, address when he left office, his farewell address. It's something I haven't read since I was in school. Perhaps no one understood the compelling public interest in the rule of law better than our former first president, George Washington, who owned, I don't know, 600 slaves, something like that, give or take, that he got from his wife. Because, you know, when he married her, she was a widow. And she had been married to an incredibly wealthy man who owned a boatload of slaves. And back then, women didn't have the property rights that they do now, the rights to own property. So I think when he married her, her property just like as a function of law became his property. So he was the wealthiest individual in the 13 colonies uh, at the time of the Revolutionary War and when he was president. He was the richest guy in the whole colonies. Trippy. Uh, his decision to voluntarily leave office after two terms marked an extraordinary divergence from nearly every world leader who had preceded him, ushering in the sacred American tradition of peacefully transitioning presidential power, a tradition that stood unbroken until January 6th, 2021. In announcing that decision, however, Washington counseled that the newfound American independence carried with it a responsibility. The very idea of the power and right of the people to establish government presupposes the duty of every individual to obey the established government. He issued a sober warning. All obstructions to the execution of laws, including group arrangements to counter, excuse me, counteract the regular deliberation and action of the constituted authorities are destructive of this fundamental principle. In Washington's view, such obstructions would prove fatal to the Republic as cunning, ambitious, and unprincipled men <laughs> will be able to subvert the power of the people to usurp for themselves the reins of government destroying afterwards the very engines which have lifted them to unjust dominion. He just described Donald Trump right there. Uh, and the judge basically goes on to say that. And, you know, again, for all these reasons, the constitutional consequences of federal criminal liability differ sharply from those of the civil liability at issue in the Fitzgerald case, Nixon v. Fitzgerald. Federal criminal liability will not impermissibly chill the decision-making of a dutiful chief executive or subject them to endless post-presidency litigation. It will, however, uphold the vital constitutional values that Fitzgerald identified as warranting the exercise of jurisdiction, maintaining the separation of powers, and vindicating the public interest in an ongoing pro criminal prosecution. So she goes through some more history, but there are a couple other parts that I wanted to get to. Um, so Trump makes a bunch of First Amendment arguments. It basically is like everything I'm being accused of is speech. That means it's First Amendment. That means I have an absolute right to say whatever I want, whenever I want to, wherever I want to say it, and to whomever. Uh, the right to freedom of speech is not absolute. It is fundamental that in, it is fundamental First Amendment jurisprudence that prohibiting and punishing speech that is integral to criminal conduct does not raise any constitutional problem. This is not new. This is not new. It's not tricky. Speech can constitute a crime. Conspiracy. Uh, it's, it's, God. I mean, he just, he's trotting out core political speech on matters of public concern. No. Statements advocating government action. No. That's not. Defendant's statements on the 2020 presidential election. It, you know, conspiracy is a crime. Obstruction is a crime. Uh, in certain contexts, lying and misrepresentation are crimes. 
Um, let's go back to where was it here? Let's go back to uh, what he was charged with. Conspiracy to defraud the United States. Conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding. Obstruction of an attempt to obstruct an official proceeding. Conspiracy against rights. Conspiracies are based on speech, period. That's how they start. Then we get to his bullshit double jeopardy clause argument again. Um, you know, unless I was impeached and removed, I can't be criminally prosecuted, blah, 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 blah. Dumb argument. Totally stupid, dumb argument. Uh, then he makes a due process argument that's also dumb. Uh, and she concludes her opinion by denying his motion to dismiss. Now, why did I spend more time on that decision than on the opinion from the D.C. Circuit Court of, opinion, uh, Court of Appeals? Um, because they basically cribbed her entire opinion. Her opinion's better written, in my opinion. Uh, it's better written. It's easier to understand. They hit all of the same high points. Uh, Trump makes all of the same arguments. They go through all of the same uh, five things that he did that resulted in the four felony charges. There's the Chutkin opinion to me is better written and easier to read and easier to understand than the DC circuit court of appeals decision. There's a lengthy section, uh, like uh, it's like nine or 10 pages long in the DC circuit court of opinions about jurisdiction, which is incredibly boring. They go through the same immunity arguments. They cite the same cases. They go through the separation of powers doctrine. They go through uh, Marbury v. Madison. It's, it's basically the same arguments and the same analysis. I just think Judge Chutkin's opinion is better written uh, and easier for non-lawyers to read and understand. So if you want to read it, it's, it's super interesting. Just Google Judge Chutkin, December 1, 2023, opinion trump immunity and you'll be able to find it quite easily uh there wasn't if i'm remembering correctly there wasn't anything really new or novel in the uh dc circuit court of appeals opinion that was not included uh in judge chutkin's opinion so i'm not going to spend any time on that and now oh god i it's like i really enjoy reading the appellate court decisions. Um, I just, I like reading that stuff. What I don't enjoy reading is pleadings written by Donald Trump's lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> they're conclusory. They're stupid. They make bad arguments. They ignore precedent. They ignore the law. They restate the law. They make up law. They just make shit up that, you know, and then they say, well, clearly this is the case. And it's like, no, that's no, no. I, it's like, so, so Trump filed this document yesterday uh, um, in the Supreme Court of the United States application for a stay of the D.C. Circuit's mandate pending the filing of a petition for a writ of cert. Blah, blah, blah. So this is his application. So in one thing that the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals did, they only gave him five days to appeal it and said you can only appeal it to the U.S. Supreme Court. Another option or avenue for appeal to him would have been for what's called an en banc appeal, spelled E-N-B-A-N-C. An en banc appeal... Uh, when the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals heard this case, it was a panel of three randomly selected judges from the D.C. Circuit Court. Um, and, you know, I, there's probably, I don't know, 20 or 30 judges. When you get an en banc appeal, the entire court hears your appeal, you know. And usually that's the next step before you go to the U.S. Supreme Court. 
the three judge panel that heard his appeal was like, nah, you don't get to do that. You get to go to the Supreme Court. That's it, period. And you only got five days to do it. Um, and then this, so Trump filed, Trump filed this yesterday. And this morning, uh, Chief Justice Roberts said to Jack Smith, you got a week to file a reply to this, which tells me they're going to fast track. They're going to fast track it. Um, I still think that they're not going to take the case. I think they're simply going to affirm the DC circuit court of appeals ruling because just last week they heard uh, oral argument in the section three Fourteenth amendment case out of Colorado, trying to remove Trump from the ballot. And they don't want to have two of these cases involving Trump at the same time. That's just too much. Second, there's absolutely no possibility that the United States is going to over the Supreme court is going to overturn this decision from the DC circuit court of appeals and say, no, you're wrong. Donald Trump has absolute immunity from criminal prosecution. There's no universe in which that happens. There just isn't, it's not going to happen. Um, so when, when you file one of these things, the first thing that you do is you, you type up this thing called questions presented. What are the questions that are being presented to the United States Supreme Court for the Supreme Court to resolve? The first one, whether the doctrine of absolute presidential immunity includes immunity from criminal prosecution for a president's official acts. Well, first of all, there is no doctrine of absolute presidential immunity. They made that up. I'm, I'm not kidding. They made that up. They just fabricated it. Second question presented is the impeachment clause, double jeopardy. We talked about that. It's a stupid argument. Um, the opening line, the opening line of this application is a quote from a baseball player named Yogi Berra. I'm not kidding. That's how they opened up their application. They opened their application to the United States Supreme Court on immunity from criminal prosecution for presidents of the United States with a quote from Yogi Berra. This application is, quote, deja vu all over again, unquote. That's bad form. That's really bad form. And I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this, but they're like, they're just like pounding their hand on the table and going, the injustice. The injustice of this, of course, presidents have immunity from criminal prosecution. These other two courts have made an absolutely egregious error. It is obvious that presidents have immunity from criminal prosecution, and then they don't cite anything to back that up. That's what I mean by self-serving statements. Um, they're absolutely aghast that Jack Smith and the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals fast-tracked this rather than let it go at its normally glacial pace. Somehow that's unfair. Uh, they're like, the D.C. Circuit Court should stay, or the, the Supreme Court should stay, the lower court opinion. So also at this, at this stage, in order for a writ for cert to be accepted normally requires a, a yay vote from four justices, four of the nine justices, saying, yeah, I want to hear this appeal to get the stay in place on the lower court proceedings requires five Supreme Court justices. And I don't think Trump's got five justices on the court who would do that for him. Put a stay on the criminal proceedings while this appeal makes its way through the Supreme Court because there's, again, they're not going to overturn this decision. I think the only, well, never mind. I'll get in trouble if I say that. <laughs> so what do they got to show? Yeah, the panel opinion below, like the district court, concludes that presidential immunity from prosecution for official acts does not exist at all. This is a stunning breach of precedent and historical norms. In 234 years of American history, no president was ever prosecuted for his official acts, nor should they be. It just, the irony just the the irony just sails right by their heads. This is this is what I mean about Trump's lawyers. 
the irony just sails right by their heads. It's never happened before because no president committed this many felonies while in office while trying to overturn the results of a free and fair election. The irony is just, there was one other thing. I'm about out of time here, but there was one other thing that I wanted to address that I thought, oh, uh, that I mentioned at the beginning that I said I would come back to. Um, they make an argument that there's, of course, the United States Supreme Court is going to grant cert. Well, that's not certain. This case raises important questions of federal law. Well, it does, but it's like you're going to lose. <laughs> There is significant possibility of reversal. No, there isn't. There's zero possibility of reversal. And they argue that the, the, the circuit court and the district court got Marbury v. Madison wrong, which, no, it didn't. It's like, you got to be able to make some of these arguments with a straight freaking face, man. It's like, I don't even know how these guys do it. Uh, then they go back into the likelihood of chilling effect on presidential action. Ugh. Okay, so then in order to grant a stay, one of the things you have to prove is that there, there is a likelihood of irreparable harm unless the, unless the Supreme Court grants Donald Trump a stay. What would that irreparable harm be, you may ask? Absent a stay, President Trump will immediately be required to bear the burdens of prosecution and trial. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're going to be prosecuted on a whole bunch of felonies. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I don't know that I would use the word harm to describe that. Here's the thing that I said I would come back to. He makes an argument that conducting the criminal trial of President Trump will inflict grave First Amendment injuries on American voters. Basically, he's making the argument that the courts are seeking to disenfranchise his millions of supporters. And the reason why I said that's a rich argument is because that is exactly what Donald Trump tried to do with the 2020 election. He tried to disenfranchise millions of voters who had voted for Joe Biden and who didn't vote for his fat ass. Um... It's just these guys make these arguments with a straight face, just completely ignoring the conduct of their own client. It's amazing. And so this court, the Supreme Court, the, here's their conclusion, should stay the D.C. Circuit's mandate pending resolution of President Trump's writ for cert. Uh, as additional relief, President Trump requests that the Supreme Court stay the D.C. Circuit's mandate pending the resolution of a petition for an en banc consideration in that court which the appellate court was like, no, you don't get this. So he's just saying, I'm going to do this again too anyway. Even though they told me I'm not allowed to, I'm going to do it anyway. Screw you. Uh, yeah. So that's that. It just, every time I have to read pleadings from his attorneys, I just, I feel like I get stupid. It, it, it just makes me dumb. It makes me dumber than I was a half an hour ago. Um, so currently... The United States Supreme Court has that application from Trump. Uh, Jack Smith has five or six more days to get his opposition or reply to the Supreme Court. I'm sure he's already got it written, uh, so he'll be filing that shortly. And then it's my hope that within a week after that, the Supreme Court just issues one of their one-page things that says, cert denied, the lower court opinion is affirmed, and that's that because this is the last delaying tactic that Donald Trump has to forestall his criminal cases. This is the very last one, his claims of presidential immunity. Uh, after the Supreme Court dispatches with this, he has no more delaying tactics left. And uh, his first criminal trial in uh, Manhattan, brought by uh, Manhattan DA Alvin Bragg on 34 felony counts, for Stormy Daniels payments is set to begin on March 25th, about six weeks from now. After the Supreme Court does away with his immunity claims, I expect the DC January 6th case uh, trial to be rescheduled probably for mid-May, mid to late May. Uh, and so hopefully we will have two of Trump's criminal trials uh, concluded and convictions in hand before the GOP convention in July, where they're going to nominate a now convicted felon 
to be their party's nominee. Yeah, good times. That's so, yeah, that's going to happen. Uh, so as any, uh, as always, massive, massive, massive thanks to my brother Falcon, uh, without whom this podcast would not be possible. The same thing with the merch store, uh, hawkmerchstore.com. Um, we have, we have four podcasts, uh, that we put out each week. We put out five episodes of those podcasts every week. You can learn more about those at hawkpodcasts.com. Uh, another big shout out to our buddy Wiseacre for his amazing graphics uh, that we use on our merch and on the podcasts. Uh, and shout out to my buddy Anu uh, for letting us use his music for our intros and our outros. Uh, so it's late. I'm going to go to bed. I got to be at court early tomorrow morning. And... Uh, I hope everybody has an amazing week and I'll talk to you guys soon. All right. Take care. And thanks again for listening. Mm -hmm.